Welcome to Sunburst uh, Sunday Meditation Service. Uh, my name is Greg, and uh, I'll be your uh, tour guide today um, through this particular subject. Our topic for today will be equanimity. Equanimity. It's just one of those words that when I first landed at Sunburst, I really had very little concept of. I didn't understand the words. I was thinking about that the other day. <laughs> when I first came here to Sunburst, I did not understand the concept of equanimity. And the first Saturday night, we had a virtues class. And we talked about the 12 virtues. And there were a couple of words in there that's like, what? What does that mean? And so I, my rational mind figured it out. It was, well, I know the word equa because I've, I've had a home equity loan, and I know that you build equity in property when you keep it longer, so it must have something to do with having a good financial state. That must be a virtue. I was shocked when I found out what it meant. It wasn't an accounting term. It wasn't a financial term. It was a spiritual term. The best definition of equanimity that I've been able to access for myself is that it's an inner balance, semicolon, a non-reactive awareness. In other words, with equanimity, you know what's going on around you, but you're not being sucked into it. You're walking a very narrow path, not being pulled this way or being pulled that way. In a deeper view, equanimity is actually how we respond to how we control, and how we balance our emotions, both positive and negative emotions. I don't think there's any doubt that there's been a storm in our life experiences in the past few years. I mean, if you look at what we've been through, um, urban riots, um, ugly politics, uh, an epidemic, just to mention a few, and what have these done to us as a people? Well, they've created an emotional storm of fear, frustration, sadness, resentment, anxiety, even anger among many. Those all would, we would consider negative emotions. And they can have a lot of power in our life if we let them have it. What I want to do today is a, something a little different. Uh, I want to get into the physical side of equanimity. I want to talk about the science of equanimity for a minute. And what I'd like to use for that is an analogy I learned from a, a neurobiologist by the name of Daniel Siegel. And he calls it the hand model of the brain and limbic system. And some of you have probably seen it because he's done this a million times on YouTube. But he has you hold your hand up, and he says, this part right here, this is your spinal cord. This is where you're receiving all the signals from your sense organs, your internal vital organs, everything else, and that feeds into this little area, the palm of your hand. The palm of your hand is basically your medulla oblongata. It's where all your vital centers are that control your heart and your breathing and your digestion, all the vital functions of your body. Your thumb out here would be your limbic system. So your limbic system is your emotional radar. It includes your hippocampus and another small part of the brain called the amygdala. And what happens is when you have sensory input to your limbic system that's emotionally based, fear, anger, disappointment, your limbic system fires up. And when it fires up, it has connection points between these things right here. This would be your upper brain, your cerebral hemispheres, and this little finger here would be your prefrontal cortex. So this is where we do our rational thinking, our reasoning, what's where our memory is. This prefrontal cortex is basically how do we respond to emotional upset. So these two guys work together very closely. 
your prefrontal cortex, and your limbic system. Now, there are connections, neural connections, between the two. So let me give you an example of something. This has never happened to any of us in this room, but suppose you were cut off in traffic, <laughs> which happens almost daily. What's that first instinct? It's to react. I'm angry. I'm ticked off at that person that just did that. And what happens is this arouses our limbic system. But when we have a fully integrated brain where all the fibers are working, our prefrontal cortex picks that up and it says, no problem, been there, done that, let it go. And the limbic system calms down. That's normal brain. However, when we are under chronic stress, and I'm not going to give you an example because you can all think of chronic stress problems yourself, but when we're under chronic, unrelenting stress, the limbic system is constantly awakened. And when it is, it starts to release hormones or signals to a gland called the pituitary gland in your brain, which then sends signals down the cord to your adrenal glands, telling your adrenal glands to release two chemicals. One is cortisol and one is adrenaline. What does cortisol do? Well, in your brain what it does is it weakens these connections. Ouch, what does that mean? It means that if we're under chronic stress from high emotional stimuli, that we can't process it properly. And because we can't turn it off, what happens is we end up in a vicious cycle, into a stimulus reaction cycle that just, we get stuck in it. Now, is it a bad thing? Well, let me tell you what it does to your body physically to have all that cortisol and adrenaline being released. It causes problems with your heart, your blood pressure, your pulse, your digestion, your breathing. Almost every vital function, including your immunity, is affected by this overload of cortisol that's being dumped. But I haven't got to the worst part yet. Cortisol causes your hippocampus to shrink, which is part of this center right here, this limbic system. Now, those of you that have done any study on Alzheimer's know that's a pathognomonic sign of Alzheimer's, is shrinkage of the hippocampus on an MRI. The second thing is the high adrenaline causes atrophy in the prefrontal cortex. So in other words, you're breaking down the ability to ever have an appropriate emotional response because you've, you're breaking this connection by shrinking this organ and shrinking this organ here in your brain. Now, I, I, I hope that I haven't depressed you all. <laughs> but one of the things that I enjoyed about Dan Siegel's hand model was that when the brain was not integrated like this and working properly, it was like this. He put his hand up like this. He goes, you know, we, we say that people who are highly emotional or in a highly emotional state can't think rationally. He said, this is why. He said they flip their lid. <laughs> they have no more connection to the area of their prefrontal cortex that allows them to control emotional responses. So the reason I brought this all up is we've been given a spiritual principle, but it also has a physical principle to it too. We are more integrated. We are more healthy. We are more like we were meant to be when we learn to control this part of our body. And what do we do that with? By learning equanimity. Hmm. There's a story I always think of when I think of equanimity because it's, it was the first story I ever read in Norm's autobiography that made me think, this was a very unusual man. This was a very empowered person. This was a very balanced individual. And the story was very simple. Yogananda had left the property um, where uh, Norm was as a monk at Mount Washington, and he had given him instructions to clean all the weeds and junk along the, the road so that when he came back it would be nice and clean. 
And they had assigned several disciples to do that. Well, Norm showed up and worked pretty much all day long, clearing weeds, making piles, loading them up in the truck to get, to take them and dump them. And just towards the end of the day when Norm was loading the truck, one of his fellow disciples showed up and started to trim some of the bushes with a trimmers. And just then, Yogananda drove in in his big black car, rolled down the window, and he said, great job, and he was pointing at the disciple who had just showed up. <laughs> great job. You did a great job. This looks fantastic. And Norm is standing there going, should I say something? <laughs> he just got here three minutes ago. I did all this work. And then he just decided, it's not important. God knows what I did. I'll just let it go. And he did. And that showed me the real metal of a man. Norm said about equanimity, he said, equanimity is the attribute expressing divine balance, physically, mentally, and spiritually. This might sound familiar, David. When you find this balance, <laughs> David quoted this yesterday in a meeting that we had. When you find this balance point within your consciousness, you will merge with true reality the only true reality, the exact center of your soul, Christ consciousness. Though we are in a storm of life's experiences, we can choose between the forces of positive and negative options surrounding us and sail our soul ship of life within the eye of the storm. So I keep getting this subject of equanimity every year. It just seems to pass to me. And there's a reason for that. I'm probably in most need of equanimity of anybody that's ever arrived here. Um, I came here with a, with a, a really bad temper and um, a very short fuse. And uh, one of the things that I have learned is how to better walk that, that balanced line, not being pulled one way or the other. And I appreciate Sunburst and what I've learned from that. There's a story of these birds that fly around hurricanes, and I don't know what the name of the bird is, but they've adopted a way to survive through a hurricane. Because if you've seen birds, they're being smashed into the side of buildings and telephone poles and trees and everything else during a hurricane. Well, these birds, instead of trying to fly out of the hurricane or fly against the wind, they fly with the wind. They just go with it. And they just glide with the wind as they get closer and closer. And finally, they find themselves in the eye of the storm where it's absolutely calm. And they just gently fly around in the eye until the hurricane has passed. To me, that is a fantastic analogy for what equanimity can bring each of us. So it's true that we're all in the storm of life's experiences and how we react or non-react is our measure of equanimity. Um, Yogananda once said this. He said, the most important condition for lasting happiness is even-mindedness. That's another way of saying equanimity, calm. Remain ever calmly centered in the self within. As a child's sandcastle disintegrates before the invading waves, so does the restless mind, lacking strength of will and perseverance, succumb to the pounding it receives from the waves of changing circumstances. So, meditation is likely the greatest tool we have for developing equanimity. On a physical basis, we know from scientific studies that when we meditate, that our hippocampus enlarges and that our prefrontal cortex enlarges. What does that mean? It means that we can better integrate our emotions in a normal brain. All right? So on a physical basis, that calmness is absolutely important. And meditation brings us that calmness. So I'd like to... Um, move us into, because I've got a, a, a few things I want to say after meditation, so I, th I think that we'll um, move into meditation here in a moment. 
Um, I would like to share with you something I read about two weeks ago in a book called The Inner Castle, which is written by St. Teresa of Avila. And she was a, a mystic Christian um, who, by all accounts, uh, knew exactly what we're practicing today. Here's what she said. There is a secret place, a radiant sanctuary. This magnificent refuge is inside you. Enter, be bold, be humble, put away the incense, forget the incantations they taught you, ask no permission from the authorities, just slip away, close your eyes, and follow your breath to the still place that leads to the invisible path that takes you home.
with your permission, I'd like to share a story with you. Um, it's, uh, it's a story that, well, it's a story about me, so I know the story very well. But the reason I'm telling the story is because it illustrates how one can go from being tormented by the winds of the hurricane, the storm, and find that calm center. So this happened uh, a dozen years ago. I was on a flight <clears throat> from Colorado to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where I was going to meet my connecting flight to Santa Barbara. And there were thunderstorms, um, as usual, going over the Rockies. And they had to fly around them, which delayed my plane. And uh, when, I, when we landed in Phoenix, I learned that as I was walking down the, the walkway to go to my next gate, that my connecting flight had taken off without waiting for the connecting flights that had been delayed from the east. And um, to be perfectly frank, I was livid. It was a Sunday night, and I needed to be in my office at 9 a.m. the next morning. Um, we were sent to another part of the terminal, but where the airline had a, um, a help desk. And I got there, and there was a line of about 35 to 40 people. What was interesting about these people is they were all angry, <laughs> like me. <laughs> and they were yelling at the two young women who were trying to rebook their tickets and get, and I was getting more worked up by the minute. And I thought, I'm really going to lay into these women and I'm going to get home. That was my mindset. I finally reached the front of the line. This was after about a half hour, still seething. And the woman called me and asked for my ticket. She said, Mr. Anderson, I want you to go sit over there in the chair by the wall and I'll call you up here when I'm ready for you. It's like, huh? Did you, ever, did you ever have an experience where you wanted to yell at somebody out of frustration and anger, and that opportunity was taken away? That's what it felt like. Somebody just pulled the rug out from underneath me. So I was pretty mad, but I sat there in the chair, and I began to watch those two women. And the one thing I realized is all the people in line were angry, and these two women were smiling and doing their best to try to keep people calm. And as I looked at that, I said, you know, they're just doing their job. Why, why was I going to yell at them? They're doing the best they can do to help all these people. And I don't know if you have a word for that, but the word I use for that is empathy. I began to feel what they must be feeling having all these angry people in front of them. And suddenly my rational mind kicked in and I started thinking, well, you know, this isn't so bad. Uh, if I can get a flight to L.A. or San Francisco or Sacramento or somewhere in between, I can rent a car and be home. I'll be at the office at 9 o'clock. It's not going to be so bad. So suddenly um, I found myself with my eyes closed meditating and saying a prayer, dear God, get me home. Finally, I was brought out of that meditation by a voice that called my name, and I walked up to the counter. Gone was my anger and my frustration. All I felt at that moment was empathy for that young lady who had been taking everybody's knives and claws. And she said to me, you're Dr. Anderson, aren't you? I said, yes. Well, you probably don't remember me. <laughs> but my family, and, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> just a, it's just cough. <laughs> you don't remember me, but my family and I saw you for years before we moved to Arizona. When I saw you in line, I automatically pulled a ticket for you on a later flight to Santa Barbara. And she handed me the ticket. So, if you were to ask me, how 
can you develop equanimity? I would probably tell you this story and then tell you what I learned from it. And here's what I learned. There was a cartoon I once saw. And there's two mice. The, and they have, each have their own wheel. And one is running frantically on the wheel. And you can see drips of sweat coming off the mouse. And the other one's lying back on the wheel like this with his arms behind his back. And the other one says, how come you're not running? He says, I had an epiphany. He got off the wheel. He was able to stop. And that would be the first thing I learned from this was if you're creating, excuse me, that's not the right word, if you are experiencing negative emotions, you're going to feel like you're being drawn into it. But there are ways that you can remove that negative emotion from you. So think about your own life. What could I do? Some of the things I thought of that have helped me in the last couple of years are reducing my internet time. I use the internet as a tool, not as entertainment. Um, getting off social media. I don't put anything on social media. I do look at Facebook and Instagram because I love pictures of pretty flowers, kitties, and fine dining. But that's about it. Um, you can turn off your television. You can stop listening to talk radio. You can stop watching the news. Get off the wheel, to me, means remove the things that are creating the negative emotions in your life. Now, if that's a person, I can't help you with that. <laughs> so, so uh, I don't know why that just came into my brain, but somebody here in the room is having a problem with a person. <laughs> the second thing would be to pause. And I think that's the most important piece right there, is to pause. Because when you have a negative emotion and you immediately have a re response to that, that's called a reaction. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. But if you pause and take time to think about what just happened, why did it happen, who is this happening from, take that moment. You can actually have the time to respond appropriately without saying something you didn't want to ever say or making somebody further or more, more angry. There's a famous neurologist named Viktor Frankl who did a lot in human relations too. And he said this, he said, and I love this quote, he said, in between the stimulants, stimulus and the response, there's a space. That's the pause. And in that space is your power and your freedom. See, if you take that time to pause before you react, you'll come from a place of heart rather than a place of emotional damage. The third thing would be to try to feel love and empathy, particularly if it's a person who's wronged you. Try to empathize. Why are they feeling this way? And I found myself in that situation looking at those two young women going, I actually feel sorry for you guys. You didn't do anything wrong, and these people are all yelling at you because they're, they're frustrated. So I guess the title for that could have been don't, don't Play the Blame Game. And the last thing would be, and probably the most important, is to meditate. See, we're out there. We're, the, we're in the hurricane. We're being whipped around in the winds, and we have a choice. We can try and fly into the wind, and just weaken ourselves, or we can find that center, the eye of the storm where there's perfect calmness, and we do that in meditation. Meditation helps us to grow our equanimity. Gandhi had a practice of meditating every Monday, all day. And he was once asked by a reporter, you know, you have so many important things that you're trying to tell people and teach people 
Why do you take a day off every work, uh, week to meditate like this? His answer was this. So my actions arise from the wisdom of my heart. Not from an emotional reaction, but from a thoughtful response from here. Not from the frustration and stress that's up here. I want to thank you for joining us today. Some of you came a distance to be here today. I will uh, echo what David said last week. We're looking forward to the day when we can fill this room like a can of sardines again. Um, but right now, we have COVID spacing. So we, d we have a small group here today. But thank you so much for being here. I hope that you stay and socialize with each other afterwards. Um, but namaste. And my prayer for you and me is that we can practice equanimity during this month of Libra in a more thoughtful and productive way. Thank you. Oh,